All right, welcome back to the Morning Brush Bag. This is episode 62. I'm here with my co-host, Robert Stevens. Bobby, what's your middle name? It's Vincent. Robert Vincent Stevens. Here we are yet again. So uh, thanks for joining us. If you're new to the show, be sure to subscribe. We're on not only YouTube and video, but on Spotify, iTunes, anywhere you listen to podcasts. So thanks for being here. Be sure to uh, subscribe to the show so you get notified with each new episode. And today, uh, who do we have on our show here, Robert? We've got University of Maryland assistant strength and conditioning coach, Will Franco. Uh, Will's native of Mass. He's been at University of Maryland since August of 2017. Yeah, so conversation was really fun today. We talked a lot about what high school players need to be prepared to enter the division one level. So obviously Will works uh, – one of his teams at University of Maryland is baseball. So he work, He knows the full ins and outs of all those those athletes and the coaches and, and the, all the programming and the rigors of their schedule. So he's a great resource for baseball strength and conditioning, which obviously we know we have a ton of uh, baseball families listening to this podcast. So – um, Bobby, what were some of your takeaways from, from the conversation with Will? I mean, we touched on a lot of things. I think the, we touched on some, some running misconceptions with the, maybe pitchers, you know, doing long distance running, some sprint work. Yep. Uh, Will had a ton of good information about, you know, just how they program a whole, you know, not just day by day, but he programs out what kids need to be doing on days they're playing, they're not playing, you know, recovery days, Kind of balancing that workload uh he tells us some misconceptions too that uh you know maybe we we as our older generation thought were good for strength and conditioning that might not be so great yeah i thought there were a lot of good myths that he kind of kind of put to rest and talk about some of the new trends and you know what high school kids you know should be doing once they've committed to a school you know what they should be doing if they're trying to get faster what they should be doing if they're trying to you know, put on weight, you know, how can you be adequately prepared to enter a D1, uh, you know, weight room when you get there and hit the ground running. So, um, yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of really interesting conversation. And what I liked about the conversation, especially is that he just made th- everything seem really simple, right? Everything's, I think, very, very clear. Um, you know, he, he speaks that so that any, you know, high school coach or travel coach or parent who doesn't have a biomechanics background can, can jump right in and say, okay, I learned, a, I learned a ton here that I can actually apply to my team or to my son or, or whoever. So, so yeah, I mean, it was a really good, really good conversation. It'd be a ton of good takeaways for, for players, parents, even coaches, where you're listening to someone at, you know, a power five conference working with elite athletes, you know, how he's, how he's managing them, how he's programming them and, you know, keep it simple as, as a lot of coaches would say. Yeah, so without further ado, we're going to jump into our conversation with Will Franco, uh, one of the strength coaches at the University of Maryland. I came from the mud, dirt on my hands, strong like a tree, there's roots where I stand. All right, Will, thanks for coming on the show, man. Good to, good to sit down and chat with you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. So... Tell us a little bit about what University of Maryland's doing, because obviously it's a crazy time. So let's kind of start there with, with COVID and how you guys are adjusting, and uh, hopefully, hopefully things are still rolling over there at uh, you know University of Maryland. Yeah, it's been it's been pretty interesting uh, to say the least. I've I've been back since the summer. Um, we've changed a lot of our protocols. So kind of the big thing once athletes go through all their check ins and they're clear with all a couple, a couple negative tests. Then kind of that first week outside is outdoor training. So what we kind of do is have to space everyone out. So we typically set up a bunch of cones to be like, hey, you're at this cone, you'll go to this cone, just to space people out because that, that's like a kind of the utmost importance right now. And then kind of once we get that, we have that first week has to be outdoors. And then once that second week, if everything's good the second week, then we start to move in indoors. We got two weight rooms. So the weight room I kind of predominantly work out of is, is 10 racks. So for us now, when they lift inside, they have to have a mask on. Um, everyone has their own equipment, so there's no sharing of the equipment at all. Um, and we're kind of really restricted. So the way we have it, it's 
basically only like barbell TRX um, work. We It's tough to use the dumbbells to prevent the guys like crossing over between the rooms. But eventually we're, once we have three weeks of indoor training, we'll be able to go partner lifts. And what we'll do with that is based upon like who's roommates with each other, um, they'll be paired up on the rack um, and go from there. So it, it's basically just trying to limit like the cross contamination guys going switching and it's tough. And then practice wise, initially for the first couple of weeks, we were only allowed like five guys on the field at once, but now we're able to do 20 guys on the field at once spread out. Usually we do like position players and then pitchers come on at a separate time. So it's been interesting, a lot of moving parts um, and it's tough making sure the guys keep their mask on, but um, they've been much better with it. I think they're starting to get adjusted with it. Yeah. How, uh... How, how much tougher is it just to organize a weight program or a strength program around all of these restrictions that you have? It's, I think for me, I honestly think it's kind of a blessing in disguise because I had to simplify it even more. Because basically for me, I hadn't seen the guy since March. Um, so I basically said, okay, I'm just going to start everyone like they're a freshman. We're just going to start from square run. Um, and we really have to emphasize the importance of acclimatization. So a lot of guys, when they come back that first week, we, they just want to go all out and like go as hard as they can. But for me, I was like, Hey, let's, let's take some sets off. Let's, let's get our movement powders down. Let's build up our workload. Um, so we were able to prevent injury. Cause if you spike too fast, too soon, you're a high risk for soft tissue injuries and things like that. So from, from the weight room perspective, on the field so we're doing sprint work which we're gradually building in volume there um using a lot more kind of resisted sprints i think from that standpoint it kind of limits the amount of velocity put on the hamstring so we put chain sprints so the guys can give maximal intent but um with shorter distances and then we'll gradually build the distances and then from there um we'll eventually take off the chains and then we'll work at longer kind of max velocity work in the weight room uh, it's simple. We're squatting, we're hinging, we're pushing, we're pulling, we're doing single leg and like core. And then obviously um, shoulder work is mixed in there as well. Um, another tough part is you can't do any partner work. So like guys can't touch each other. So all the shoulder work has to be with like bands or like light um, yeah. weights. Uh, just making sure the guys are spaced out. Usually I like to do kind of rhythmic stabilization, have the guys work together, but from that standpoint, just making sure everyone's spaced out and we're just hitting our kind of meat and potatoes. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so, Will, we, we're going to cover a bunch of topics today. And I know Bobby and I want to talk a lot about high school athletes and getting them prepped for college. And so let's kind of start there a little bit. So when you get a new freshman, obviously at University of Maryland, you guys get really good athletes, right? You guys get a lot of the premium kids in all sports from, you know, not only the mid Atlantic, but you know, you guys start to pull up from all over. So when you get a new freshman, what are the things that coach Will Franco hopes that he can do in the weight room? Yeah, I, I think initially is just teaching them how to move in the most basic terms of like, basically we want to teach, teach them how to squat and then teach them how to hinge. And from that, it's basically just, we start with body weight and we'll do like goblet squats. Um, we'll start with a PVC pipe to teach the hinge position. It's basically like not a lot of load from the beginning. And the basic thing I do is almost tempo it. So I think the tempo work and then the isometric work, one tempo work, they can kind of feel the movement through a hinge pattern. And then an isometric movement is get them in that position that they need to be in. Um, and be like, hey, this is where I want you to be when we hit a certain position. So they kind of understand, okay, this is what I'm looking for. So then when we gradually progress load, they know, hey, remember in square one when we did this? It's the exact same. We're just mm -hmm. doing a little bit heavier this time. Um, okay. And I think un teaching them the importance of the process and how to slow cook everything. Um, because think about it, I'm going to have these guys for at least three years. A lot of guys maybe get drafted in year three, but at least three years. So we have plenty of time to build. And I, I look at it year by year. Year one is uh, movement competence, competency and, and kind of putting on muscle mass. Year two is developing maximal strength. And then years three and four is where we kind of do an emphasis more on speed and power, where 
we're still emphasizing those qualities and teaching them in the first kind of phases and years with the guys, but then I just get it to a little bit more where their needs are. Okay. So what would you say are common things you see incoming freshmen don't do well and things that they typically do do well as, you know, obviously like a, a division one recruit? Yeah, I think, I honestly think the hip hinge, a lot of guys really had, if they haven't had like a strength coach or formal training, teaching the hip hinge is very confusing because a lot of guys want to squat, like squat into the hinge as opposed to just bending at the hip. Um, I, I've seen that as a big restriction. A lot of ankle mobility has been a issue I've seen because I guess for us, we have a lot of basketball guys that come in. So there's a lot of li limitations with their ankle mobility. And even we've had a couple of guys come in with some Tommy John, not this year, but in the years past. So is, is getting them to kind of understand the importance of movement to see why they may have, why that injury may have occurred. Was it like a strength issue? Was it a mechanical issue where our pitching coach kind of works on? And those are kind of the main things. Um, I, I think from a, what they do really well, a, a lot of, we recruit a lot of guys with good motors and, and they like to get after it and they understand the importance of working out. Like I don't, it's not a thing where I have to get them going every day. They really do that well. Um, but I also think they understand, they, they pick up things very fast. So a lot of kids are super coachable. So once I teach them a certain position or how to land, then they understand it and they get it from uh, the time being from there. So those are kind of the two main things that kind of, that I've noticed. It, the, the one thing you touched on, I want to touch on a little bit more is the, is the lack of ankle mobility for basketball players. Not necessarily that specifically, but yeah. I've got a lot of parents that say, you know, college recruiters like multi-sport athletes. They like guys that play multiple sports. Do you have, or see any benefit uh, more so with the guys that come from high school that play two, three sports than the guys that maybe just focus on baseball in high school? Is there any difference, maybe positive or negative, uh, when they come into the weight room? Yeah, I think, I think one is uh, when, we, when we do more of our field work, so our, like our sprinting, our jumping, our throwing, the guys that have played multiple sports, they kind of have um, – I would say more body control, kind of just more pure athleticism as opposed to some of our guys who just did like baseball. I think, I think playing multiple sports is, is a good thing to have because you learn different movements and different rotations and how to jump and all that type of stuff. But at some point you need to focus on baseball, I think gradually easing into it. So I, I wouldn't say it's a complete negative, but from what I've noticed is the pure athleticism from other from multiple sport athletes. Yeah, I can see that, definitely. Yeah. And jumping back to, to stuff that incoming freshman, because I'm trying to go through my list. When, when you've got a freshman, he weighs X. When he leaves the program, graduates or gets drafted, typically how much weight has he added during his course, uh, his time at Maryland? So the one I can know off the top of my head, we have this one guy, he came in, with uh, Tommy John, so he, like, just had a surgery. He wasn't working out at all. He was probably 210 pounds. And then now he's – how, how tall? He's 6'4", 6'5". Okay. Now he's so that's kind of skinny. Yeah. yeah, he was skinny, yeah. Now he's, like, 240. So he's a, he's a big dude. But typically, obviously, it's position-based. Um, but I think anywhere from, like, 10 to 15 pounds um, – you'll see a good jump. We had another kid who actually showed me a picture of himself the other day. He literally looked like a different human and he's like a naturally skinny guy. He's probably like 195. Now he's like 215, 220. So obviously like that first year, you see the biggest jump and kind of the size and strength. So um, I would say anywhere from like 10 to 15 pounds on average. Gotcha. That's a pretty, and of course I think you guys are probably getting athletes who are more, there than smaller schools is what I guess. Bobby, you, would you probably maybe tend to agree or maybe not as much today? No, I think the big, t I think the power five conferences are getting more physically developed kids. I mean, you're getting com is committed earlier. And if you're committing early, you've probably, Wait, you say physically... no, I feel like you're agreeing with me. I feel like that was what I was saying. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree with you. I agree. He said, you. no, I don't know. That's you're killing, what you're I... killing me, Bob. Okay. I... So you, Bobby, you yes. tend to agree. 
Okay. Edit that out. Edit that out. Yes. I'm not editing anything. No, I, I, we're not I agree with that you. Out, but okay. I agree with well, you. Well, you said no. Sure. Who's, who agrees by saying no? I do. That's, I, don't, I don't want to agree with you, so I have to somehow get my mind to, in that space. Okay. okay. But okay. yes, absolutely. I think Power 5 guys in general, just when you, I see high school kids around the country that are committed early, they're just physical specimens normally, whether they're significantly taller Mm-hmm. broader shoulders they've developed earlier so they're probably you're probably coming in with a better uh base than the mid-major kid who you know is starting to peak as a senior yeah that I, I seems to be I, what people are recruiting right i mean you get guys i mean obviously it's you know the biggest most physical kids are coming off the board earlier getting the d1 scholarships you know place like university of maryland baseball guys are probably getting a lot of their money as you know, after their sophomore year in that summer, right? So these are the kids that are going to be more like grown men earlier. Was that kind of accurate, Will? Yeah, I would say, and going off of that, what what our pitching coach, obviously our um, our hitting coach as well, and our coaching staff in general, um, they place a huge priority on the weight room. So when they recruit these guys, they're like, you need to have a strength coach before you come in. Yeah. So like, I'll, there's six guys on my on our staff right now that that have trained at Crescent. So like these guys, I, they come in, I'm like, okay, you, you're good. You know what you're pretty much doing. We may need to work on a couple of things, but these guys have strength coaches and, and our, our, our coaches are like, you need to, you need to train. So when Will gets you, he can help you even more. You can make a significant jump. So it, it comes with the coaching staff and putting a priority on it and they do an excellent job. So they just, they give me the tools and I just, do what I need to do with each guy. But, and then going off of that also nutrition wise, we have a full-time dietitian that we work with. So that year one, they'll meet with each freshman and they'll go over, Hey, you need to work on this. This is where your body fat percentage is. This is where your weight is. And um, what we've done also is based upon kind of what position they are, the optimal range of like body fat percentage they should be. So like obviously like outfielders and middle infielders, they're in the more of like the eight to like 11%. Whereas the, uh, um, the corner outfielders or corner infielders are maybe more 10 to 12%. Pitchers can vary um, from like 10 to 14% as, as an ideal. <laughs> but was, yeah, my head yeah. laughing from 10% all the way up to David Wells, you know, yeah, any, yeah. anywhere in between. Yeah. Our guys call it the old velo pouch when they, uh, when they, when they're chilling. So, but obviously like different guys, different body types, but we try to put them in a right range. And a lot of guys think like, oh, my body fat percentage should be like 5% where that puts them more at a risk because then if you get sick or injured, you have no fat to kind of help you out. So then you start losing a significant amount of lean mass, which you're trying to avoid. So Mm -hmm. Um, education, the guys are super important. um, And our dietitians do an excellent job helping us out. So sticking with the freshman stuff before we kind of transition out of that, Speed training is obviously a big deal for everyone. Everyone wants to get faster. So if a high school kid say, you know, Maryland signs a kid and they say, Hey coach, can you advise me on the best way to get faster? I want to take two, you know, two ticks off my 60 time before I I arrive at Maryland. What would you advise a high school kid do to get faster? Do high school track. Honestly, do high school track. Cause then those coaches like track and field is like, the foundation of sprinting so understanding certain kind of characteristics that are utilized in the track and field I think that's a significant opponent you'll learn how to run fast you'll learn the proper mechanics of sprinting which a lot of kids don't understand mm-hmm. those sp- certain characteristics now if you're going to do track be a sprinter don't be a long distance person be a sprinter because you look at the sprinters Fair. those are the fastest people in the world the longer distance, they're not big and physical. So as a baseball player, you want to be fast and physical. So doing high school track is a significant portion. But if you don't have access to do track, like indoor, or you're playing basketball, um, I think understanding that sprinting comes with a significant amount of rest. A rule of thumb I use for our guys or some guys when they go home, every 10 yards you sprint, you need a minute rest period. So a lot of guys want to do like suicides. I don't know, I'm going to get faster suicides and let's do 300-yard shuttles. But that's not going to make you faster because, one, 
you're not producing a high amount of force. And second of all, you're not getting a lot enough recovery. Because when you think about it with sprinters, they sprint for, if you're doing 100 meter, 10 seconds, then they're resting for like 10 to 20 minutes before they do the next rep because you want to maximize your recovery so you can maximize the amount of force you can put in the ground so you can be faster. Okay. I think do you just feel like high school of, kids – sorry, go ahead, Bob. I was just say the act of the act of actually getting out there and going full go, I don't think kids do enough. I don't yeah. think they do enough of just actual full go sprinting. Mm -hmm. They'll do the – They'll, they'll do their condi conditioning, quote unquote conditioning, base running at the end of the practice, whatever they do with their high school team. And it's, it's a 60, 70 percent, you know, they're going at the pace of the, of the crowd. Mm -hmm. And then they want to know why their 60 time is 75. So well, have yeah. you run a 60 in the last <laughs> six months that like has <laughs> to test how fast you are? It's just, it, it sounds funny, but it's it, the, even my most advanced players, they don't do enough full go sprinting yeah and i think it's just because they just don't understand the concept is like they they feel like they're not working out as hard but like in reality you're putting a a lot of stress on the body when you are full out sprinting right sorry dan didn't mean to cut you off there i did mean to cut you no off there. but that was that was to my point too which is that you know i, I don't think kids sprint enough and i don't think they are aware of just how much consistency it requires to be fast. Like they need to go out probably, you know, it depends on their overall workload. Like if they're playing basketball, they, they probably can't go out and, you know, sprint two, three times a week on top of that. But most kids just don't go out and do a sprint workout. Like they don't go to a local field and actually, like you said, go full bore. Cause I think that's a really good point that you do. You just like chase your teammates, whatever pace they go, you go, you don't want to feel like Johnny hustle and you know, you're going, you know, full blast and everyone's just, Hey, you know, we're just easing into it. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so will, do you guys send, so you have in, incoming freshmen. I mean, you said a lot of guys have their own strength coach, but do you guys give them a, a incoming workout for the, the previous summer? Or like, when do you guys start to like get your claws into new recruits? Yeah. So there, there's like an NCA rule where I can't have, I can't send them a workout program until, I think they've officially signed, so signing day. Um, but typically what we've done in the past, obviously COVID kind of messing things up, we bring the guys on campus for six weeks in the summer. And that has been a significant change because basically I can teach them kind of like the standards that I'm looking for for each guy. Um, I can teach them the fundamental movement pattern, patterns. We can do a, um, a full-on like movement screen um, with our athletic trainer. So me and him have a good relationship that we go there. So we kind of basically got microscope, where's this kid at? Where's he at physically? Where's he at weight wise? What is his body fat? We take him in there, finally get our hands on him. And then we can start training. And then from there, we just kind of in, implement like our, our basic movement patterns from a slow pace. So by the time they come back, so they'll be on campus for six weeks. They usually go home for two weeks in August or a week in August and they come back. Uh, at the end of August when we start um, training as a team. So the first two years that we did that, when we came back, like the upper class were like, holy crap, these kids really like hold each other accountable and they really like kind of know what's going on. I'm like, yeah, man, it took me a while in the summer for to get them to figure it out. So mm -hmm. um, from that standpoint, and then I, I usually send them, if, if some sometimes we get like transfers late, I'll send them programs usually over that summer um, – or building up into the fall when they return. Gotcha. That makes sense. Um, and then a couple other things for sprint training. I know there's a bunch of myths out there. Like everyone wants to, I remember again, like my gym parents come in, Oh, little Johnny needs to get faster. Can you do some ladder drills with them? I'm like, how about no? <laughs> you know? um, can you talk to sprint training and some of the myths that you think are out there? Cause obviously like plyometrics are not a myth but they're often misapplied, right? They're applied at the wrong time. You have skinny, weak kids who are doing plyometrics, probably doesn't have much benefit, ladder, ladder drills. Um, but what's your take on things like ladder drills, you know, uh, like agility ladders, um, plyometrics, Vertimax, any of those kind of things? Yeah, I, I think from a ladder standpoint, I think it's an excellent tool to use for like a warm up to kind of get a lot of foot contacts and kind of build it in from there. Uh, 
So I, I wouldn't, that's not going to get you faster. I wouldn't recommend that utilizing that tool to get you faster. I think like we talked about um, using sprinting as a tool, start with short accelerations and then gradually build the distance over time. Uh, other myths. Oh, so like ply, basically plyometrics, a cool thing that people don't understand when you're, tr when you're trying to set up kind of like your workout program, you want to mimic whatever you're doing sprint wise to match what you're doing um, jump wise. So like when we're looking at acceleration, so acceleration is primary horizontal force production because you're like leaning forward. Whereas like a max velocity is more uh, vertical. So the amount of force you're putting into the ground. So I usually think like, Oh, broad jumps should be paired with um, acceleration work because you're kind of working the same plane. You're going horizontally. Mm -hmm. Whereas yeah. more vertical jumps should be associated with max velocity because you're trying to train the same signal. So vertical jumps, hurdle hop, things like that. The, uh, the key area where I think you should start with biometrics is learning how to land. I think that's the one concept that people don't understand is can you absorb force and can you land correctly? So typically we start with our guys, even with our freshman snap downs. So can you reach overhead, snap down to an athletic position and stop your body under control? Then from there, we'll kind of graduate to kind of altitude drops or depth drops. So they'll like stand off a bench and stick the ground and learn how to land correctly. And then from there, we'll do like a stick, like they'll do a depth drop, pause, and then do a vertical jump and then stick. So like you're, you're learning kind of the most simplistic way to kind of land and kind of absorb force. And I think that's a key thing. The other thing is I think a lot of people don't understand the switching from extensive to like intensive. So like extensive is like little hops. So like pogo jumps, or um, if you're familiar with Altus, the track and field company, they do like a, a rudimentary series where they do in like little hops, which are they're low force production, but you're teaching the kind of ankle and Achilles to make contact with the ground and be like explosive very lightly. And then as you gradually progress and once they develop some type of um, capacity for that, for their ankle complex, then you switch to the more intensive jumps. So like bra jumps, like depth drum jumps and things that are going to be more inten intensive where they have to maximize the amount of force they kind of put into the ground. So a lot of people just want to go to the, the cool depth dr jumps and depth drops and like the really kind of intense stuff where in reality you got to build a base and kind of, build that work capacity so you want to be prepared for the more intense stuff as we kind of progress. So I kind of do that with our guys. And I think people want to do all the, like the high box jumps and things mm -hmm. like that. It's like, no, we want to, we want to land an athletic position every time. I don't care how high the box is. I want you to land in that nice athletic snap down position because landing with your butt at your ankles is not the ideal athletic position that you're going to be in, that you're going to be on the field. So that's kind of how I look at it. Gotcha. What about any of those fancy jump shoes or are there any, are there any tricks out there that you would recommend? Like obviously not all tools in the weight room are bad, right? Barbells tool, yep. um, foam rollers, a tool, whatever. Uh, but there's a lot of gimmicky ones. Are there any that maybe seem gimmicky that you actually really like or things that you definitely recommend a high school kid do? I don't, I, I don't know. I, I usually keep it pretty simple. I, anything from like dumbbell loaded jumps. I know you mentioned like Vertimax. I think Vertimax is kind of like people may think that's giving me, but it's a kind of a simple way to get a loaded jump. In. And if anyone has like a hand or injury restriction or a shoulder injury, like you can still do some type of loaded jump when you just put that on your way. So uh, mm -hmm. I think I know a lot of basketball players may use that one, but um, teaching that the kind of learn to put force in the ground with some type of load on you is, is a, can, can help you. Gotcha. What about those shoes that had the little discs on the front of the toes that you walked on back in the day? You know, what yeah, I'm, I don't, about? I, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of those. I think if anything, you should take your shoes off when you're kind of doing like light plyometrics to kind of get a sense of feeling the ground with your feet. Well, have you ever seen these shoes? I think they're called Kangoo. Have you ever seen those? I don't you know, know. What I'm talking about. I don't think I have. No. They've got like a football size, uh, a football shaped thing on the bottom, and it's like a an elastomer. So yeah. imagine a shoe with an open this on the bottom, and yeah. it just like acts like a shock absorber. <laughs> I I had seen them on TV or uh, on YouTube, 
and they have like fitness classes and they're more overseas. Like they're kind of popular. They have people, you go into class and you like pull up your, your, your boots on and it's just like makes your feet like a trampoline yeah. and they're so weird looking and silly. But I saw a woman running with them yesterday in real life here in DC and it was mind blowing. Maybe she's got like terrible joints or she's got like, I don't know, but they were How fast they were was she going. I wish I could pull this up at the moment, but it's going to be too, too slow to do that. Yeah. Oh, very live, slow. Very I slow. I live in DC, so maybe I'll, maybe I'll run into her too. Okay. Yeah. She, uh, I mean, she's exercising, so you can't, I'm not really like, hating on them. Like, I don't know her situation, but they are an insane little weird technology. Well, I'm just, I just pulled them up on Amazon and they're completely sold out. So <laughs> we're, you're behind the times, Dan. <laughs> Kangoo, Kangoo. Um, so moving on this time of year at university of Maryland, obviously it's the fall. So can you kind of take us through a little bit of like what an off season workout looks like for, you know, a high level D one program, like university of Maryland and how it might differ from when you guys hit the end season? Yeah. So, um, in a, t in a typical off season, kind of that fall is where we kind of really kind of build our base of, um, strength. So obviously I think that's a, that's a major component. Um, to our sport. Uh, I utilize kind of like the vertical integration model where you're training everything at once. So you're training speed, you're training power, you're training strength, um, and you're doing conditioning as well. You're training everything at once. But at certain points of the fall, I'll emphasize certain components. So maybe that first kind of week back, first couple of weeks back, we're working on work capacity, um, kind of just develop them, getting those guys to build a base. Maybe some hypertrophy work is going to be associated with that as well. Um, but we're also doing med ball throws paired with that. And med ball stuff and power stuff. But maybe we're doing more of the teaching component of that. So like landing mechanics and things like that. Um, a lot of deceleration throws and deceleration landings. Um, and then our speed work, which will be – We'll, we won't run at full speed yet. So we want to build in kind of their work capacity to run full speed. I think if you – speed is very important, but you have to ease into it and build kind of volume and intensity gradually uh, because you're going to have like soft tissue and guys' hamstrings aren't going to be prepared for that as well. So then the next couple of weeks we'll have kind of like a strength emphasis um, – and then we'll gradually, maybe we're starting to do more acceleration, full speed acceleration work. Um, and maybe we're touching on some more um, med ball throw variations and things like that. And then uh, as we progress towards the end of the fall, maybe we'll do, I, I'm not a big fan of max testing, but we'll, we'll maybe touch some kind of either heavy singles, triples and doubles um, to kind of get kind of a good number for the guys. So they have a kind of component to train that in the fall. But then we'll also kind of work on kind of – we'll build that good strength and then we'll start to shift towards kind of like a power development because I think that's kind of a key component as we kind of work into the, the season. And then as we're in season, we're trying to keep the qualities that we built upon in the past, but maybe we can still maximize um, certain strength gains. So usually like some of our, our younger guys, they kind of continually to get strong because we put them at like such a – like a slow base level initially. So I've had a couple guys like PR on squat and deadlift in season because we're still just gradually progressing them. And I, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people think, um, oh, like you're maxing out, you shouldn't focus on strength in season. But I, I do it based upon guys feel like if we had a, a three game set and we just came back from like Florida or California, we had an overnight, like a red eye, like, no, we're not. Ma we're maximizing recovery on those days. But um, I think the conversations we have with the guys are super important in season. Um, we do a lot of kind of like wellness questionnaires and I see the guys basically every day. So, Hey, I'm like, Hey, if you're feeling pretty good, maybe uh, I'll give them options. You'll have like maybe three sets to five sets. If you're feeling good, hit five, uh, five reps, three to five reps. Mm -hmm. if you're feeling good. You hit three, five reps. Maybe if you're feeling like crap, maybe you only do two sets on exercises. So it's a it's an ever encompassing model, and then let's say we have like an off day or we don't have a midweek, we can kind of push the strength a little bit because we'll have a little bit more time to recover. So so the in season is just kind of building off the qualities we built in the fall, which are building our speed, building our strength, um, which we've worked on hypertrophy as well. 
but obviously we want to limit the volume in season and keep the intensity relatively high so we can keep kind of the strength levels and power levels that we need. Gotcha. So, so how individualized is, is that in season workout? Like if I'm the shortstop and Dan's a, the Friday starter, you know, we both come back on Monday. How much yeah, different is Friday it? Friday guy. Nice. Nice. Dan's a yeah. Friday. We'll give Dan the Friday guy. How, yes. how much different is that workout uh, for the, for each of us? And I guess compared to the rest of the team, is it, is it all individualized? Is it, is it kind of educated? Is everybody educated as they go and they can make their own assumptions on what they need? Yeah. So starting pitchers probably have the most kind of convenient schedule when it comes to the in season component. So typically how, how I kind of operate for them. So like, let's say starter Friday guy. So guy pitched on Friday, Next day he comes in, it's, it's mobility, it's we're doing tempo runs, all it's a basically like a full-out recovery day. There's, we won't touch weights at all. Then he got his recovery day, and then the next day, so Sunday, he'll do all his strength work. Uh, there maybe we're hitting like our squat pattern. Um, depends on kind of each guy, but a squat pattern, whether it's single leg or double leg, based upon what I think the guy needs. Um, Monday he'll typically have off. Tuesday, he'll usually throw his bullpen. So he'll throw his bullpen and then he'll lift afterward. Usually on that day, I'll kind of do more kind of like concentric only. So maybe we're doing more trap bar, uh, maybe more step ups, maybe more hip bridges. So he's not getting as sore as he goes into the weekend. So then he'll have, then that Wednesday and Thursday, he'll kind of have an option. He can do a primer, he can do another recovery day before he kind of leads up to his start. And then as you go for the Saturday guy, the Sunday guy, it's kind of the same concept. He's going like recovery day, lift day, recovery day, lift day, maybe a primer day where you're doing more explosive work. Now okay. with the positional players and kind of the bullpen guys, they don't have the luxury of kind of winning, knowing when they're going to go. So for them, we kind of keep their kind of lifting schedule, like pretty like routine. So like either like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or like, if we have a lot of games like Tuesday, Thursday, basically they're going to lift on the same schedule because you, you never know when you're going to lift. Sometimes they'll lift on game day based upon what the schedule is because the in-season schedule is a little bit crazy. Now, with regards to like individualization, the, the, like I said before, it's all about the conversation I have with the guys. So I need to kind of understand where they're at physically. So some guys may feel good some days and some guys may not feel good the other days. So it, it's it's – giving them the autonomy to understand, okay, if I feel like crap this day, I'm going to go a little bit lighter in the weight room. We're still going to lift because we still want to get that stimulus. We can't just not lift and get weaker, but maybe on another day where we're feeling good, we can push it a little bit more. And I think um, high school kids don't lift in season where in college baseball, it's like a priority, like lifting in season is, is utmost importance for keeping you strong and healthy. Um, but also making sure you're not like losing velocity late in the season because we still need to keep our strength. What is uh what does running look like today in college baseball? Like for, for, for the pitching staff specifically. So we, what? we don't do like, we don't run, we rarely run poles anymore. We're, we're starting to get away from like the long distance running. I utilize tempo runs, which basically I'll give a guy a distance, whether it's 50, 75, 100 yards, and they're running at a, a 70, 60, 65 to 75% of their like full speed. And basically, we're not going extensive distances, so I'll, I'll kind of track like how much distance we cover. Um, and I think we'll rarely, rarely go over like 1,800 yards or something like that. We'll keep it on the low end because we want to promote that running as recovery. And I think um, a lot of guys actually like to run. Um, some of the guys of our pitching staff from the, a long distance standpoint, but I kind of educate them to, hey, we don't need to run long distance. We just need to do some type of running to get some type of recovery throughout the body. But a lot of our running per se is more sprint work. And I think that's where uh, educating them is like, yo, we don't, we still need to maximize our force production in our sprinting, 
we're going to do tempo runs for recovery and building a base. And as, as we do that in season, it's a recovery component. It's not a conditioning component. I think explaining it, that's an epiphany I had is like, like tempo runs is not conditioning. It's recovery because it's mm-hmm. going to help your body recover. You're going to get blood flow to certain muscles you need. Um, and then you're just going to have just, you're going to feel better when you go into lift the next day because you're not going to be as sore. So, so is there not a conditioning uh, component during the season or is that more just the off season or where does conditioning fit in? Uh, it's more, I mean, it's, we do it year round. It's a little bit tougher to do for the position players in season, but for the pitchers um, based upon when they know, like if a guy is super sore after like a, like let's say he, he come into like long relief and a bullpen guy needs to run, like he'll, he'll do his conditioning on or tempo runs or recovery runs on the following day that he throws, if he knows he's not going to go in. So it, it's just, I utilize it as a recovery component. It's not a lot of volume. It's just enough to kind of get some blood flow into the certain muscles that they need. So it's not like in the off season, it's, it, it's, we do it at least once a week. Um, but in the in season, since it's a little bit more structured and I have a little bit more time with the guys, I can do it a lot more more kind of with the starters as, as, as a key component for kind of the recovery throughout the season. Gotcha. And then as far as conditioning goes in like the off season, I mean, do guys, do you have any of those big days where they're doing, you know, repeater sprints and suicides and some of that really tough stuff, or is that sort of like less of a priority for you? That l- less of a priority for me. I, I think when you look at it, um, can it, like conditioning, you need some level of conditioning to help with, you need to develop some type of aerobic capacity with, through running and stuff like that, because uh, especially p- position players, they cover a lot of volume, sneakily a lot of volume in practice. So they, they actually get a lot of their running in practice. So that when I look at them, like, I don't really need them to do as much conditioning as they think, because they're mm-hmm. strength and power athletes. They're not like runners. So um, the speed, strength and power are the, most important component that I look at yeah and especially for pitchers I think it's hard for people to grasp a lot of times just that you really don't get in shape as far as pitching shape from anything except for actual pitching you can throw 80 pitch bullpens which I don't recommend but you know (laughs) teams try to sometimes get your pitch count up before the season in the fall like you're throwing longer bullpens as a starter but you just don't really get in shape until you're actually out in a game I mean even in spring training it's like you're throwing full bore and you just don't feel like you're in shape until six weeks into the season. I feel like a lot of people don't really get that unless they've lived it. Yeah. And I've actually talked to, like, I've never worked in the major league baseball, but fortunately during this time, I was able to talk to a couple of guys and they say actually for their position players, they do a lot more running um, for hamstring injury prevention. So they, they want to be able to prepare those guys for, they, they actually they actually say they like run the crap out of them a little bit just because um, that's the easiest way to kind of prevent hamstring injury is, is build sheer volume of running and expose them for mm-hmm. tempo runs. I don't, I don't know exactly what they do, but they said they actually build a lot of volume and they'll do other components where they'll do base running, but they'll do it at shorter distances. So like you almost run it like around a little league field. So they kind of prepares them for like tighter turns and mm. more exposure and it will limit their top end velocity initially. And then they'll gradually build to the more 90 degree, uh, 90 degree, 90 feet around yeah. the bases eventually. So their body's a little bit more prepared. So they use a lot of that running on the front end to kind of help them out, which I think I'll probably do that once we come back in kind of the winter time in January is start with more, kind of shorter distance like curved runs and then build to the full base running. Hmm. That's an interesting concept. I've never heard of that before. That's interesting for sure. So do you feel like, and do they feel like hamstring injuries are a product of the change of direction and the the tight curves? Is that a piece of it? Yeah, it could be a piece. It could be, I mean, sometimes it's not preventable, but um, obviously there could be a way like how you step on the base. Like if you're not stepping on the front, like from part of the bag that could hurt you. If your heel striking into the bag, that's going to set up a, a risk for hamstring injury. So, but I think not exposing yourself to higher velocities and higher volumes on the front end, like building in your work capacity. Like I said, if you do too much too soon, your hamstrings are not ready for the amount of sheer volume and intensity that you're placed upon. Mm-hmm. So gradually building in your distance, like I do, like that's 
basically like what I'm doing in the weight room now and on the field is preparing for those guys for when we go to team practice and, and full scrimmage, they're prepared to run at full speed because they spent that time with me. Let's, I want to talk a little bit about the, the notion of preventable versus non-preventable injuries. Cause I think this is a big misnomer for a lot of folks, but you know, one frustration with me in the pitching world is that people want to say, Oh, and I get this like routinely people are like, Oh, this is why I got Tommy John. This is why I hurt my arm. Like, you don't know that. Like what you just, you somehow isolated the one variable in your body and you've decided that that's, that's the sole reason that you hurt your arm. Like we can make educated guesses, but um, as a strength coach, what injuries do you feel like are preventable? And w- w- like you just mentioned, like some things are not, where does, where do they fall into the sort of the two buckets? Yeah, I think kind of what we've talked I think, I mean, no injury is preventable. That's, that's, I think we all know that like mm-hmm. there's freak things that happen. Um, there's little things that you have no control over where you cannot understand. Um, but I think preparing yourself and understanding that gradual increase of volume is the most important thing, gradually increase of volume and intensity. So if you, if you start a throwing program and you saw on driveline that guys are ripping pull downs, like, and you start just ripping pull downs without preparing your body to do that, then you're setting yourself up for injury. If you don't understand concepts like going from, Maybe you go flat ground, then down to a slope. When you go down to a slope, that's going to put more stress on your arm. If you're not prepared for that slope, that's going to have a whole list of issues. But I think, I think the education component um, of the warm up and like activating, like our pitchers take almost like 45 minutes to an hour to get ready to throw, and I think that has put them in a better spot um, to decrease their risk of injury from the shoulder and, all, and the elbow and things like that. And our co- pitching coach does an awesome job of knowing where guys are at, um, like throwing wise. And I think guys now understand, and I think baseball is a perspective, at least the pitchers understand the importance of the warm up. So you go through your dynamic, you do uh, a lot of guys do wrist weights, a lot of guys do J bands and, and taking your time through those things and making sure all those little muscles in those in your shoulder and rotator cuff are activated before you start really throwing, generate enough heat in your body and then gradually go into it. Um, we haven't had too many like shoulder issues. Um, and we haven't had, we've had one Tommy John um, in the past and since three years I've been here, like, like that happened when he was here. Mm-hmm. So I, I think there's a lot more education on the front end from like kind of the warm up and how to build your body. But also I think the kids are getting much smarter. Like we had a camp, I, I could not believe it. When we had a camp, we had kids coming in who were like sophomores and understanding the importance of um, like creating separation or lead leg blocking. And like, I was like thinking when I was at their age, I didn't know anything about yeah. anything. And I think there's a lot of good education out there. There's a lot of good coaches that are on, like, telling these kids, Hey, this is like what you need to do. Um, these are certain things you should know. And obviously there's good and bad, but I think the impo- people understanding the importance of getting your body ready to throw a baseball is, is really important. You really need to take the time because it is a, one of the most stressful things you can do uh, for your elbow. So uh, I think the whole like warm up and education component has been the biggest change to prevent a lot of injuries that you see in the past well how do you marry that with especially being a reliever when you just have to sometimes just like get up and be in the game really fast really soon like how do you marry those two where you said you know it's sometimes 45 minutes your guys are warming up to throw but then in the game they might like i was personally in a game in four minutes from when i was called once so like how do you how do you get them ready to do both of those things so uh, what we do is kind of throughout the game, um, the, co- the coach will, our pitcher coach will kind of give a frame right who might go in like at mm-hmm. some point of the game, but usually the whole pitching staff, like during an inning, like maybe like five guys, they'll just go down to the bullpen. They'll maybe hit a couple J bands, hit a couple stretches, um, maybe foam roll a little bit, just to kind of keep their body like moving and warm uh, throughout the game. So it'll be like, hey, 
Um, third inning, hey, go down, like do a couple stretches. Um, fourth inning, hey, maybe go down, just do a couple shoulder J bands. Next inning, come back. Maybe you're going to stay down there and you can do maybe a couple plyo throws or whatever you need. So their, their body is somewhat warm um, throughout the game. So they're not going in completely cold. I, I know I've seen like teams in the past, hey, just run down to the foul pole, run back, and you'll be fine. But uh, we take the pride in kind of making sure, hey, go down there. You know what you need to get your body ready, what stretches, what mobility. Um, you've done all this stuff in the off season. Pick pick your plan. So usually we have notebooks for the guys. So like the, they'll write down, hey, if I go down the third inning, I'm doing this. Fourth inning, I'm doing this. Fifth inning, I'm doing this. Sixth inning, okay, I'm, I'm going to start maybe tossing a little bit and getting ready to go in the game. Um, mm-hmm. So we do a lot of a lot of the education. Hey, your mind needs to be ready. Like you need to act like you're going in. Don't go down there and just dilly-dally. Go down there uh, on a mission and know what you need to do to get warm, whether you want to throw a little bit, do their mobility, and write it down in your notebook so you know, hey, I felt good going in this game. So I did these things, all right? So maybe I'm going to keep that in my routine for the game. Gotcha. So, so you mentioned know, like know what you need to do for specific guys. How much do you, leeway do you give some of these guys that come in and like they're doing things that you disagree with, but it's maybe necessary for their psyche to feel like they're actually strong or actually in shape? I mean, the one, the one thing I can remember is working out with a guy who's, uh, you know, uh, his max – bench press made him feel like his whole off season was worth it being in shape. (laughs) Like he needed to bench press, whatever, 350. And that might not benefit anybody in the baseball world, but you know, that was like his thing. So the guy we worked out with, all right, we're going to let him bend. Like this is like his, you know, dangle the carrot, I guess, type uh, workout. How much leeway do the guys have with you with, you know, if they come in with something like that, something maybe a little unorthodox. Yeah. I mean, I think the what well, I think you you guys all know the one thing that kind of controls everything is the mind. And I think if there's a disagreement with something or something I don't believe, I, I go down and talk to them and build a relationship and kind of educate them. Hey, we want to do this because of X, Y, and Z. And I, I don't think it's in the best interest for you. But at the end of the day, he knows what he needs to get his body ready. I can't. I, he knows his body way more than I do. I, I can give him certain components and I haven't had too many difficult issues with guys with what they kind of need. Like they know their routines and their warm ups um, more so like for the for the pregame stuff and like in game, I let them do you're it's you're in the game. You gotta do what you need. Weight room, I, I have like, hey, we need to do these kind of components. If I see some type of uh, restriction or limitation for a guy, I'll switch up an exercise for him and be, Hey, we need to do this because of this. Um, uh, and I think educating them on certain things they need, but so it comes down to confidence. If you're feeling good, like and your mindset's good because you hit a max bench, like then you're no, you're not getting hit, hurt and you're doing it with right technique. That's fine, man. Like then go in and get after it. That word. Do you, and do you feel like you have to regulate personalities a lot to say because you said you you give guys a lot of leeway like hey you can only do two reps today instead of five if you don't feel that good or you know we can do this but as we both know there are some guys who just always don't feel that good right yeah they don't they don't feel good and yeah and that that that's the thing where it comes down to hey i'm i'm giving this to uh, for you as a tool so don't don't abuse it now Mm -hmm. like Obviously, you're in season. You're going to be sore. There's going to be some days um, you're going to feel like crap where you still need to get in your sets that you need to. But it comes down to watching guys, using my coaching eye, and be like, okay, what's going on? Like, why are you not giving me a full effort? Like, is something going on in your life? And that's kind of where we utilize our wellness questionnaire. And I can see – I see sleep level. I see motivational level. I can see fatigue level. And – I see that like they they send me that and fill it out in the morning so I can talk to them. I've seen in the afternoon. Hey, like or we're lifting in the afternoon. Hey, what's going on? Like why are you like that? And it actually starts some good conversation with guys. And I think if they know that I'm there for them and they kind of understand that relationship, um, that they'll 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 do what they need to do. But I, I think it just comes down to education and um, understanding the mind of each individual and understanding some guys want to know the why some guys just, I just want to get after it. Like 
leave me alone. And I think a good book that kind of opened me up to that was Conscious Coaching by Brett Bartholomew. And it uh, shows all the different personalities of athletes. So you have like the soldier. So the soldier is like the guy, you just tell him what to do. You don't have to worry about him at all. And he'll just go, th- go through like what he needs to do. Then you got like the overthinker. So like, if you tell him something, he'll think about it for the next 20 minutes. And it's like, you got to approach those guys in a different way because of if you tell them something to make them overthink, then they're just going to not, their mindset's not going to be yeah, like, they get hey, lost. Exactly. And then you got like, I think one of the terms you use like the sabotager who wants to like be the fun guy and like not focus those guys, you know, kind of get in their ass a little bit more. So you got to understand, I think I've taken more of the ownership of understanding the personality of each guy um, and knowing what I need to do. And some guys I can leave alone because they're, I don't have to worry about some guys are going to get on a little bit more because they're just going to slack off based upon kind of who they are. So um, we haven't had too many issues, but I think that's a good kind of thing to have in your back pocket as a coach is understanding the the psychology side of training and, and athletics as opposed to kind of just the physical side. Yeah. What other, I know we've gotten a lot smarter on the mental side in the last, you know, handful of years, five years, people are starting to talk about mindset a lot more and, and mental health and all these things. What other trends have you seen that are, can you give us a couple positive trends, trends that you really like in strength and conditioning and maybe a couple ones that you're like, yeah, I'm glad that flamed out. Like I thought that was BS and this was a come and go kind of thing. Yeah. The, uh, I think the big thing that's kind of come and gone. I mean, I, I think people are starting to realize that like not every workout has to be like, insanely hard i think a lot of people like i gotta go like if i'm not like seeing red or i'm not like thrown up like that's that wasn't a good workout and i that that isn't kind of the way because basically you're just putting too much stress too soon on the kid's body he's not ready for it Mm -hmm. um educating like hey after each workout you should feel good like you shouldn't feel like crap um i also think another trend that's slowly coming away which i think is the the we're strength coaches. So we have to focus on max strength all the time. It's like strength is up good up until a certain point. Um, And people are out there trying to figure out what is the optimal kind of strength level for for each individual. Is it two times body weight? Is it 1.5 times body weight? Uh, You got to look at kind of each guy and each guy, some guys may be able to like put on squat pro fire easily. Some guys can probably after three years, barely squat 225. And, you kind of just kind of look at each guy and you got to see what level, if you go through a strength phase or you're going through a phase of max strength development and they're not improving, like we're, we're just trying to get five pounds better or like just a little bit better. We could probably put our eggs in a, a different basket to improve them. It's like, once we cap that max strength, all right, they have that strength level based upon who they are. Let's shift to more kind of explosive work because that's what they do on the field. Baseball and hitting is, and baseball in general is a very explosive sport. So yeah. we need to develop that strength on the front end, but then we've got to simulate the game somehow and, and doing more explosive work more. Or maybe you do um, speed squats. Maybe you do more squats paired with a box jump. Like whatever it is, whatever your kind of pool or method that you're using, shifting kind of gears. And I think people are slowly starting to realize that, like, just because you can squat 405 doesn't mean you need to squat 500, like, Mm-hmm. Four five is good enough. Yeah. And that was when I saw probably in the last couple of years where people were like a lot of round back deadlifts on Instagram from some of the bigger, you know, baseball companies. And I'm like, this is trash. Like yeah. you don't need to be deadlifting 600 pounds, especially with crappy form. And it's like, where's the diminishing returns on that? Like you said, 400 pounds is probably good enough for some guys. Maybe it's 450 for some guys. Maybe it's 500, but you don't have to deadlift 600 to throw baseball 92. Like, yeah. Like there's it's it, baseball is the weirdest sport. You can have a guy that weighs a buck 60, 5'11, throw 95. And then a guy who's 6'3, 220 and throw, can, can't break 90. It's, it's, there's only like it, each guy's different. So you got to find what they need uh, based upon kind of their characteristic. Yeah. I think the big trends that, over the last 10 years is obviously the velocity and in pitchers and the, the weighted ball stuff, the different workouts, you know, geared towards just throwing hard, throwing hard. 
do you guys incorporate any of that stuff? Do you see kids coming in with their own routine that, that either you're on board with, or maybe makes you cringe because he's 120 pounds and, you know, throwing 12 ounce balls, 500 feet. Yeah. I, our, our pitching coach kind of handles all a lot of the kind of like the weighted ball stuff. Some guys have like, we, when we like first, when our coaching staff first got here, there were some guys who liked to do like, there was like weighted ball holds, but most of the guys like our pitching coach, Hey, these are, these are the tools we have. We have, we have wrist weights. We have pile balls. We have, um, uh, we have this like, uh, I forget what they're like the, uh, baton things. I forget what they're called, but, they have these are these are tools. I'm I basically giving you all everything you need. Use what works. Use what doesn't work. And at the end of the day, you know your body better. And like, obviously, if guys are doing like crappy form and like like over rotating or, or their arms dragging behind, then we then we correct their kind of mechanics from there. But we we give them a kind of certain leeway. But at the end of the day, it's like they got to be doing it right and correctly. They can't be just like throwing. 12 ounce balls like crazy like some guys like to throw weighted balls some guys don't so mm-hmm. and it and based upon the guy like some guys don't throw and they throw well some guys do throw and they throw well and um you you have to really i think you really just have to understand how your body works and um obviously our pitching goes a great grasp on each guy and what they need um mechanically so um it's good to see that our coach um Coach Moose, he does an awesome job. So you said you've been working with uh, the baseball team to kind of integrate skills training with strength training or just kind of like match the two up and, and pair them better together. Can you talk a little bit about, about that? Yeah, so this is kind of over, – over COVID, I was able to do a lot more kind of continuing, continuing ed. And one area I got really kind of into was the, the kind of the biomechanics of – hitting and uh, I know you've had coach Swope on re- previously me him and I are kind of working hard together to see how we can kind of integrate certain things in the weight room to certain things uh, that he does in the cage or like on the field so one thing we try to do is um, so basically I utilize the Charlie Francis model which is like a high low model basically like on one day like the high day is all the days you do your sprinting your jumping your uh, med ball throws and you're like heavy lifting. And then on your low days, it's more like um, lighter days. So like that's where you do like your light tempo runs. Maybe you're doing some like light med ball circuits, like things that are not super intensive. Mm-hmm. So like when we look at it, it's like swope, you know that I'm going to do like we're squatting on this day, we're sprinting on this day. So with we want to do all the hard stuff on one day. So if we do all the hard stuff on one day, um, maybe he's doing more um, different types of swings. We, we do a thing where you hit the bag where it's like pretty intense or they're high CNS kind of batting, like hitting stuff. So on the following day where maybe I'm doing more like tempo runs or recovery stuff, hitting wise, maybe he's doing like half swings or he's doing like movement, like movement prep stuff. That's not, you're still getting a lot of movement patterns, but it's super light. Guys are getting a little bit of sweat, but it's not as intense as like constantly swinging a bat. And the, the thought process of it is, is if I like squat heavy one day um, and do all our hard stuff, and then the next day we swope doing all this hard stuff like in the, the batting cage or on the field, then the guys are never going to fully recover because usually mm-hmm. people lift like Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So you're doing hard stuff every day and their body's not fully prepped. So then – that's when you see more injuries there. It, there's more, you'll maybe see like an oblique strain or like something where they're just bought their body's not fully recovered because the recovery is super important. So, and then going off that for like team practice. So maybe on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we're lifting, but on Tuesday, Thursday, maybe I don't have a scheduled conditioning session with them, but maybe I'm doing more kind of tempo runs, but it's base running. So it's lighter base running. They're getting their heart rate up just a little bit, but we're promoting that as recovery. And maybe we're doing like ground balls, but we're not throwing. So you're still getting some movement, but you're not taking on the intensity of throwing. And then maybe on Friday, you do kind of like your harder, like game simulated drills um, based upon kind of what we're doing. So you're just trying to mirror 
certain things. And then one area we really got into was kind of the, the scissor kick or staying anchored uh, with your back foot on like a swing. So we'll, we started to do some med ball throws with a scissor kick for some guys. And you can see it, it, the guys kind of rotate a little bit better. And then other things where we started with was kind of decel throws. So like we call it like fake throws. And to getting guys to understand to like be really fluid and then put the brakes on at the last second. Because I think a lot we, we've seen um, some of the courses we've taken is that the brakes are the most important thing. How fast can you stop your pelvis when you rotate? Because the analogy we've used is, Picture yourself, you're riding on a bike and you're going full speed into a curb. So my, but the bike is your pelvis. My body is my upper body. So my secondary mover. So if I drive full speed into a curb, I'm putting on the brakes, my pelvis stops, which the bike's off, and then my body flies off. Mm -hmm. So just like when you swing, that pelvis stops and then the upper body rotates. So I'm able to translate more power. So um, if you don't have a good brake system, you're not going to optimize the amount of kind of your, your swing pattern, whatever it is. So putting that kind of metaphor or analogy into kind of like, hey, we we're doing the scissor kick because like it's this is what we want to decel the pelvis, want to rotate, get block that front side and do our med ball throw. So looking at the components of the swing, obviously like everything – I do in the weight room is very general. We may touch some specific stuff, but the only way they're going to get better at their skill, at their, at their skill is doing the skill, not um, doing stuff in the weight room. And I think I just, I, I play a guide, but it's not like we're taking like weighted bats in the weight room and we're stretch, strapping them to the Kaiser and swinging like, no, not mm -hmm. nothing like that. It's just taking kind of the movement patterns and the concept that they kind of do in their, um, in their, in their skill and putting him with a med ball, so med ball. So that's kind of the way I look at it. So why wouldn't you want to uh, strap bands or, you know, like you said, uh, like the Kaiser machines, or those are like the air actuated yep. typically ones. So why don't people want to do that? So because when you put, if you take the skills of like a weighted bat and you strap to that, then that's just going to mess up the, the mechanical aspect of the swing. And the best way to do the mechanical aspect of the swing is not loaded and going through what you're actually going to do. Cause then you're just going to create improper movement patterns because like it's a load and you're like trying to rotate and it's going to maybe throw off where his hands connect at. So you, you don't want to take the, the weight room and make it the skill. So. Yeah. You don't make them too similar. They start to fight each other a little bit. Exactly. Then you, they fight each other. Cause the best way to get better at swinging a bat is, is learning how to swing a bat, not strapping it to a Kaiser and swinging a bat. Gotcha. Yeah. I think that's one of those things where I'm sure you've seen your, your share of Instagram and uh, you know, YouTube hilarity where people are, you know, they're on two BOSU balls and they're, you know, doing this and that and they're swinging a thing on a rope and yeah. it's like, that's insanity and it's not making you better. Yeah. As our coaching staff calls it we call that eye wash so good old eye wash yeah. yep um well speaking of that do you, uh are there any other gimmicks like bosu balls for example was super popular 10 years ago you still see some drills does any of this unstable surface training have its place beyond sort of like rehab uh you're talking about like within regards to um like the weight room or in like practice or like skill development uh, let's go either any anywhere you want to talk about it because I think yeah. unstable service training is very misunderstood by parents. You think, oh, little Johnny could use more balance. That seems great, but I don't know. Is it? No, yeah, I I think the because a lot of people like utilize Bosu balls as a way for like stability training and like I think bouncing on a Bosu ball and like, I think Alvin Kamara did a thing where he's bouncing on a Bosu ball and like catching like a baton that has like different colors. That's not going to translate to the sport. You want to get better at your sport. Your sport is on a stable surface. So, so we want to train on that surface because the amount of, if we're talking about sprinting, you want to maximize the amount of force you put in the ground by putting it in like actual ground. If you put it on a Bosu ball, there's no, the force, it's unstable. So 
I think people, uh, it's, it's relevant in kind of the rehab setting um, when you're trying to get back like certain characteristics, but then eventually you want to bridge the gap and build back into hard ground and hard surface training. Um, we utilize it for guys like, like slide board. I think it's a good way to kind of um, develop in the, in the lateral plane. We do like a lot of lateral lunges or a lot of slide board squats. So um, it's a great way to kind of develop balance and target certain muscles you may not need get. But at the end of the day, training on a flat ground is probably going to translate a little bit more than translate um, than an unstable surface. Um, I think some coaches have used like BOSU balls or like unstable stuff for guys like on the back foot. If they, if they're like putting their weight too much on their back foot um, and getting stuck in their swing. Um, I, I think it can help with like balance, but in my realm where strength and power is super important, I think unstable surface training is not kind of the best solution for what you're trying to get out of it. Gotcha. Well, for training, so I want to go back to the youth side for a second here because I work with a lot of youth kids. I have tons of younger players that maybe are just seeing the weight room for the first time. And aside from like the the basic, you know, do push-ups at home or, uh, you know, do some pull-ups at home. Are there some baseline things that you would tell a like a freshman in high school that's just getting started to to work on to perfect before he starts throwing weight around or – powerlifting yeah I, I i honestly think one of the best resources out there um is movement over maxes by uh, zach at tcu um i was able to talk to him over the COVID as well and get to know him pretty well but that book if you want to get better at the fundamental movement patterns which for him is squatting hinging pushing pulling iso core um iso side abs single leg, uh, single leg ISO. Those are the best ways to develop yourself because those are the foundational movement patterns. Those have proven to work and those will never go away because once, because even I use them, we, we still squat, we still hinge, we still push, we still pull, we do single leg work, we do core work. So that book from, from a foundational movement standard is awesome and he'll go into things like freehand squat uh landmine squat the kind of goblet squat to kind of pattern them position them and then load them and i think that's what um people need to understand you need to pattern it i don't know you need to position them then you need to pattern it and then you need to load them eventually and i think there's certain exercises that he has in that book that put you in a position to succeed so when you graduate to the more kind of um quote unquote, more advanced or higher level, more intense kind of strength work. Um, that stuff is, is uh, just a blueprint to help you out. And it, and it's meant he, though he wrote it for kind of high school, um, high school kids, but he also wrote it for like baseball coaches who have to write the strength program. So like, mm -hmm. like travel coaches. So it, it's pretty simple and it puts you in a good spot to kind of understand that um, it's the, it's the most foundational thing you could do and movement is way more important than what your max is. And I think that's just a very fitting um, description for his book. So I utilize that, but that book is probably the biggest reference for people who are in high school. Okay. So as we kind of wrap up here, what are some, I want to hear something that you used to believe that you've now maybe don't believe or you've gotten away from something you would like to instill in a coach or a player and any last advice you'd have for someone who wants to play perhaps at the level of, you know, university of Maryland. So big D one baseball. Yeah. So one thing that I used to believe was, I mean, we've touched on this before. I used to think like every workout needed to be hard. Cause like, that's basically like when I was in high school, I was like, I, I enjoyed working out. I was like, I need to get after like, if I'm not like sore as hell after every workout, like I didn't work hard enough. So using soreness as an in indicator of how good a workout was, um, was kind of the big thing. Um, what was it? What was the next part? It was what I, what I learned, what I changed and what I've done new now. 
What, what would you instill into a, what, what, what wisdom would you instill to someone who's maybe going to play D1 baseball? And also what would you impress upon someone who, um, I think I'm just making up new questions. Now. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to hear what your good takeaways are um, from, you know, working with a lot of really high athletes and developing as a coach and any of that. So let's not make it any specific questions, but just what, what's some good blanket Will Franco advice? Uh, I think the biggest thing is one of our core values of our of our team and our uh, coaching staff and our players is having a growth mindset. So we, you have to be open minded about everything. And I think where a lot of kids struggle is when they come into the University of Maryland, they were they were a good player. Like you were freaking good. Like you wouldn't play here if you were a good player, but now everyone that you're playing against is pretty damn good too. So a lot of kids fail early on and often. And it, I, I think it really messes with their mentality because they were, they were the top dog for so long for high school and travel ball. Like, Oh, I was the guy that got recruited to Maryland, but you're going to fail in life. And the, the quicker you can understand that failure is a prerequisite to success that is going to help you much longer. And I've made mistakes and I've been in, uh, and I've learned from my past failures and I've been in situations where I've been the dumbest guy in the room, but being that dumb guy actually made me much smarter than I actually think I am. I'm still not smart in general, but being in those, being in those rooms has really helped me because you're, when you're a growth mindset, you're going to be around people that are much smarter than you and better than you but those people are going to elevate you because of your open-mindedness and new ideas and trying new things and not being afraid to fail because those, those things are so pivotal. And not only like baseball, like baseball, you fail seven out of 10 times, you're a hall of famer baseball. You, you're not going to strike out every guy like you did in summer ball. Like you're, you're going up against guys who are going to get drafted and you're playing in it's borderline professional college baseball now with how good kids are. So you need to understand that you need to maybe change things that you did and understanding the the game, having the game IQ. I think that that helps people a lot, like having a feel for the game and understanding, oh, I need to hide my ball. So the guy at second base doesn't pick my sign where now kids are good enough to pick up on that and read it and coaching staff. So, knowing knowing the iq and knowing that you're gonna fail but it's gonna be okay like that failure is gonna help you out so much more down the road well will we really appreciate you being on the show um i mean really wide-ranging topics i think a lot of really good advice bobby do you feel like you got the advice that you need for your flock did you, uh, did you I, get it i feel like you come back on will you i'm gonna need you for another hour and a half I've got some real specific questions from some of these parents I need debunked by a, by a strength guy better than myself. Yeah. No. It, yeah. Sorry. My, uh, my, usually the podcast I'm on, I'm usually very ADD friendly. So I kind of jump around a little bit. So um, I appreciate you guys having me on. I'd love to be on again and um, keep doing your thing. I've listened to a couple of you guys' episodes, so I really enjoy it. And uh, it was great to meet you guys as well, which is awesome. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you're in the DC area, so we'll have to grab coffee or something, but, um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, a lot of really good advice for parents, for other coaches. And we, uh, we're just always trying to find good people who can, can condense ideas, which you've done a great job of today, making things seem really simple and relatable because strength and conditioning is not that simple. It's very complex. And when you start breaking down the programming and dealing with all these different personalities and players and positions and seasons and goals, there's a lot going on there, but you, I think you made it really, really simple today for our audience, which I know everyone will appreciate. So, Will, thanks again, and uh, talk to you soon, man. Thanks, Will. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem, guys. Have a good one. <laughs>